It's another cable show about God. Your host is Dr. Craig Johnson, pastor of Bethel Christian Fellowship in Agoura Hills and professor in residence at Chalcedon Christian Academy. This morning we're going to talk about small things and, and the importance of not demeaning or despising small things. You know, we're Americans. We love everything. We want the biggest and we want the newest and we want the best and we want the blessed. And we, we tend to shy away from things that appear insignificant or appear small or appear tiny. But remember, you, can't, you were once a microscopic little thing. See, we despise small things. We, we demean in our world system anything that appears weak, but God loves small things. I've never forgotten this, and I've taught it to my children. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of the shoe, the horse was lost. For want of the horse, the rider was lost. For want of the rider, the battle was lost. And for want of the battle, the war was lost, all for the loss of a nail. Little things are important. Big things hang on little nails in life. And we're so prone to be dismissive of things that appear insignificant, yet everything God does in his kingdom begins initially in insignificance. I want to read a verse from Zechariah chapter 4, and I'll give you the context in just a minute. But it's a man who is facing impossible odds that are set against him. This occurs in about 519 B.C. The children of God are sent back to the land, and a man named Zerubbabel is given a task to rebuild the temple. Actually, he's given a threefold task we'll look at in a minute. But they were three impossible tasks that represented a mountain in his life that was impossible for him to climb. And I'm going to speak to some people who have a mountain in front of them today. But, you know, God's going to call us to do a simple thing. And he's going to do all the heavy lifting. Remember the theme of this year. It's a year of favor when God does all the heavy lifting. Listen to Zechariah 4, 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Let me pause right there. Your hands have laid the foundation of some things, and your hands are going to finish it, not somebody else Amen. jumping up to take your ministry. Amen. All right, that's a whole tape right there. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. May God bless the reading of his word. This is a story all throughout the Bible. The David and Goliath theme was the popular story that symbolized the nation of Israel. Because David was a small boy who went against a huge giant, and he won. He took little pebbles, and he pierced brass instruments of war, and he won. And Israel was a little despised nation, but nonetheless, they stood against the empires of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. The theme throughout the Bible is God takes little seemingly insignificant things the world demeans, and he in his power by his spirit does an amazing thing supernaturally through small instrumentalities. Remember he used the, the shepherd's staff of Moses, that small instrumentality to split the Red Sea and bring the great deliverance of God's people. God used a cloud the size of a man's hand in the ministry of Elisha and brought enough rain to absolutely uh, uh, inundate the land after three years of famine. God took five loaves and two fishes from a little boy's lunch, and when they took, he took them and blessed them and broke them and multiplied them and fed 20,000 people. God loves insignificant little things. Everything he does begins small and progressively achieves and attains its destiny. So I don't want you to demean and belittle. Now, here's the story of Zerubbabel. He comes back from uh, the children of God had sinned, and they were 70 years in Babylonian captivity, and then God raises his people up and he brings them back. Only, there's only a little bit of a problem here. The temple is in ruins. The land is in ruins. It's in enemy occupation. And God calls Zerubbabel, number one, 
he calls him to rebuild a nation state. So he brings these people back from captivity into their ruined land. It's still ruined. And there's just a few people. They're disheartened. They're disunited. They're poor. They're struggling. They're reluctant. And there's enemies everywhere. And Zerubbabel's job, the mountain before him, the task before him is, I want you to bring them all back and give them a pep talk <laughs> and reinstill in them a sense of passion and purpose. <laughs> That's a big task. So first, he's called to rebuild the nation state. Second, he's got to rekindle their faith after the exile. These people lost the temple. They lost their land. They lost their identity. They've been away from their roots spiritually. They haven't had a revival in 70 years. And Zerubbabel is the point man for rekindling in them a sense of, there's an open heaven ahead. Revival's going to happen again. Hey, hey. Zerubbabel's got that task. So, so all of us, so this guy, he's got to rebuild the nation state, rekindle their faith, and third, he's got to reestablish the temple and all that it represented. And there's no food, there's no materials, there's no money, and everyone's disheartened and depressed and on meds. So you now understand in Zechariah 4 why Zerubbabel sees a mountain. His task is impossible. It's like you standing, looking at Mount Rushmore, you know, Mount Everest with a spoon in your hand. And God says, I want you to grind that all up into sugar, and I want you to go move it over here about 30 feet. It's impossible. And yet Zerubbabel is looking at this task that God has given, and God speaks to him, and he says, Zerubbabel, I am going to call you just to do your part. First, don't despise what's immediately in front of you. The key to Zerubbabel seeing that mountain moved is God was with him, number one. It's the Spirit of God that anointed him. But secondly, he's just going to have to pick up one stone in the rubble. There they are at the site of the great temple of Solomon with the old timers still alive who saw it to, to, to absolutely depress them. I saw the temple of Solomon. You'll never rebuild that. Oh, whatever you do, it'll never. There's always someone to encourage you to want to go kill them, kill yourself, you know. Oh, no, no, it doesn't matter what you build here. It'll never touch one of the wonders of the ancient world. Loved one, I don't care what the devil says, trying to depress you and bring you discouragement and trying to defeat you. Zerubbabel had a mountain, and God said, Who art thou, O mountain? All they would have to do is pick up one little piece of rubble at a time from here and move it over there. God is calling us to do the simple thing that is right in front of our hand. Who's the person right in front of you? What's the need standing right in front of you? What's the situation confronting you right now? Just do that little thing and take your little spoon and get a spoonful of dust from the rubble side of the temple. Move over here. Throw it in the junk heap one day at a time, one step at a time, one act of obedience at a time and God's Spirit is going to do the heavy lifting and he'll blow the mountain away. Someone say amen. Who art thou, O mountain? I don't know what your mountain is. It could be your lack of education. It could be your background. It could be incest. It could be your looks. It could, whatever your mountain is, God says, who art thou, O mountain, to stand in the way of fulfillment when God speaks a word over your life, he will bring that word to pass. You just do the next right thing. You just take your teaspoon and put a little dust from the former rubble site and move it over here and throw it. You do your little thing that looks so insignificant. You know, there's a parable of Jesus, and I'll just mention it to you. It's in Luke chapter 19, verse 12, where Jesus says a man uh, gave a bunch of talents. Let's say gave a bunch of money to his associates, and he left. And he said, now I want you to be responsible with the money I've given you. And one had 10 talents. It could be whatever you want it to be. He had $10 million, and he invested. It. He got money back. And one of them, and the second guy invested his. The third guy didn't do anything with his little talent. He went and buried it. And when the Lord comes back, he goes, hey, wait a minute. You know, you invested yours and got a, a, a something in back. And the second guy invested his. And what would you do with yours? And he, his point is, why, this old thing, what can you do with one pound? He demeaned. He despised. He treated what God had given him insignificantly. And by despising what was in his hand and what was in his sphere of influence and what was immediately before him, he receives a rebuke from the Lord. God will never say, when you get to heaven, why weren't you more like Jerry Falwell? He will say, why weren't you more like you? 